a larger mosaic. The screen resolutions increase, the pixel becomes smaller and smaller, becoming the invisible cells of an image. Early video game consoles worked within a very small screen resolution. The Atari 2600 used 192 by 160 pixels, and the Nintendo Entertainment System 256 by 240, while your HDTV uses 1920 by 1080. This meant that graphics created on these old systems could only be so visually complex and have a restricted colour palette. There's also the classic story of Mario and Zelda creator Shigeru Miyamoto giving Mario a big nose and moustache to get around the lack of facial detail. Much of this visual style was constructed with readability and gameplay in mind rather than any visual aesthetic. It was often also created by programmers who may not have had any real art background. Nowadays, most people see these visuals as crude and dated, our best attempts to realise something visually within the confines of technical limitation. But there are a core group of artists, musicians and designers who have returned to the scene of our early digital years to take another look at and uncover the unconsidered artistic merit and exploring the powerful possibilities of the pixel. Jason Rohrer is at the forefront of the indie art game movement. His short 100x16 pixel game, Passage, is a surprisingly moving and engaging representation of life and death. He did all this with two characters no more than eight pixels tall. I recently had the pleasure of interviewing him, in which he spread some light on the mysteries of the pixel aesthetic. For my third game, Passage, I stumbled onto pixel art almost by accident just because of the, the event that I was making Passage for demanded that the games be low resolution. So I was making a low res resolution game and that basically means pixel art. And once I started using pixel art, I realized how powerful it was because, well, first of all, it does look like something that came off of a computer. It's not really trying to emulate a visual style from any other medium. Second of all, it has this sort of, you know, it can be representational, but at the same time, it's abstract enough that you, there's all this room for interpretation. So it's blocky and it looks computerized and it looks like something that's at home on the computer, but it also has this kind of expressive power and this kind of ambiguity to it. The more specific you draw something, according to Scott McCloud, the less likely people are to sort of identify with it and attach to it. It becomes a very particular person. It doesn't become just anybody or it doesn't, it doesn't leave room for you to step into it. I don't believe that pixel art existed in the way that we remember it existing. If you go back to like the 8-bit era uh, and you play a Nintendo game or one of those games that's normally think of, th thought of as being pixelated from that era, you play it, one of those games on a TV set, which is the way we all played them, you don't see pixels at all because TV sets are so blurry. Um, you know, I, and, and if I think back about playing like Legend of Zelda or something like that and thinking about the little sprites that were used for different objects, they really kind of took on this um, almost unidentifiable character where you couldn't really tell what something was, like there was a little fairy or something in Legend of Zelda. And looking at it on a blurry TV set, you couldn't tell which part was her head and which part was her arm. And so you just really kind of had to imagine what she actually looked like. When we think about pixel art uh, and think about you know retro pixel art, that's because we're going back and we're playing these old games on emulators, on computers that have high-resolution monitors that are not blurry. And you know when a computer goes to blow up a Nintendo screen, which I think is like 320 by 240 or something like that, and it goes to blow it up onto your monitor, it makes all the pixels into boxes with perfect sharp corners. So then when we play Mario or try to grab a screenshot of Mario or something like that from one of these emulators, then we see all these sharp blocky pixels and that kind of uh, similar to the way uh, when a friend ages over time, your memories of them as a younger person are sort of replaced by how they look now. I found this quite startling that in our search for recreating nostalgia, we have created a warped, crisp digital version. There are some artists who present their work on the original hardware to avoid this, such as Ian Bogost's recent Atari interactive art game, A Slow Year, being presented on an original system and game cartridge. I can't help but feel that much of this content is a hard response to the crisp digital 3D graphics of modern games. Again, Jason Rohrer on the subject. You know, state it the way I've stated it in terms of, like, calling 3D just a fad and saying, you know, 3D limits game design and all these other things that I've observed and come to realize. You know, I don't, I don't really think there's consensus on that point. Those people are still from the out, are looking sort of from the outside at video games generally, and they'll see screenshots from Assassin's Creed or whatever with all the uh, Renaissance-era architecture or whatever it is, <laughs> and, and they'll, they'll be sort of blown away by that still screenshot and say, wow, look at those beautiful graphics. That's, you know, where video games are going, and that's like... You know, that's sort of the pinnacle, the state of the art. I guess they, they just don't really have literacy in, in pixel art kind of stuff. 
Does the pixel art style only entice nostalgic past gamers, and does it have any real value to the greater public? Another facet of this 8-bit movement is the rise of the chiptune scene, musicians creating electronic music using the hardware of old game consoles, most popularly the original Game Boy, another nostalgic and raw movement which has made its way somewhat into the mainstream music industry. I talked to Alex Yabsley, stage name dot AY, a Brisbane chiptune artist, on the subject. There was a wide front page of their website recently where they had a video game imagery invades music videos or something. There's, there's like, I think, 12 different music videos that all use pixel art. And um, someone posted on a chip music forum about it, just saying, oh, look, this, this thing's on wide. And there is always the kind of comeback of, oh, it's going mainstream, quick, let's bail and keep it underground. There's definitely a specific musical sound to video game music. I always like to look at it. Video game music is always made to accompany something, whereas the stuff that chip musicians do is really bringing the music to the forefront. I mean, there's always a backlash to, I guess, chip can be seen as one, but electronic music was getting more and more shiny and glossy, especially in the pop music world even more. It just kind of has that perfected digital sheen that everything kind of has its little place and sounds nice and neat. Chip's kind of definitely the most obvious and in, in the fact that it, it is essentially going back 20 years in sound quality. Nostalgia seems to be the initial driving force for many of these artists. The same way that childhood experience plays a large part in any traditional artist's work, but there seems to be something more to the pixel, an alluring rawness and freedom in its simplicity. My final interview is with Joe Brum, an animator who has traditionally worked with cutout style animation, most recently on Charlie and Lola. Joe made a pixel style animation called Dan the Man, which has recently exploded online with close to 3.5 million YouTube views. Set within a video game world, the player character discovers there's life after rescuing the princess. You know, the iconic sort of look of it, I think, makes it so universal. Like, uh, a character just can take on... The, the audience, I think, assigns so much more to it. Leaving a lot of information out, uh, it, it definitely does leave the audience a lot freer to, to assign different things to it. A lot of those games in your head you think yeah that was so good and then you get one of these emulators and you play them and, and, and often they don't match up to your, your memories. But animation wise it was it was ideal because it was you know it was suddenly a break from having to do really smooth animation and you could you could take pixel art into smooth realms but down at you know 40 by 40 pixels uh, limited animation really comes into its own. There is something I really like about the, the kind of simplicity of pixel art. It's very bold colours, it's strong outlines, and part of me feels like it's a bit of a cheat as well, do you know what I mean? Like I'm not a particularly good fine artist, so there's something nice about distilling it down to pretty much, I suppose, its, its most basic level of information, you know, but still retaining a character. How different is it to pointillism or, you know, the, I suppose even Surat was kind of he got down onto that dot, dot to dot level, didn't he? Joe makes a great point. How different is pixel art from some of the previous abstract art movements? Pointillism, mosaic and Roman tile work, geometric abstraction, tapestry and many of the modernist geometric styles. It's very easy to make the connections. The argument might be about the process rather than the result. Pixel art is created digitally, while traditional art by hand. The pixel movement's strength lies in its abstract simplicity. Jason, Alex and Joe all agree. It may be pulling on our nostalgic strings of a perceived romantic childhood of arcade cabinets and controllers, but similar things could be said about the arts and crafts movement, vintage fashion and black and white film. So does the pixel style have a greater value to people outside the world of games and computer tech? As we progress further and further into the digital age, whether at art, entertainment or communication, the pixel is still our iconic starting point. It's our digital paint and easel, chisel and stone, bricks and mortar, paper and pen. We can connect with its simplicity and find deeper meaning in its abstraction. It has its own visual language, imagery, movement, interaction and audio. So yes, I believe it does.
You know, I don't know what the, the standard definition of an antique is, and some people say it's 25 years, because after that amount of time, pretty much any object becomes interesting in its own right, even if it was, you know, totally trivial and totally discardable when it was created. When we look down real close and see our little cave paintings, our antique pixels, we can nostalgically remember our digital heritage and see that they are quite literally part of a much bigger picture. As screen resolutions increase, the pixel becomes smaller and smaller, becoming the invisible cells of an image. Early video game consoles worked within a very small screen resolution. The Atari 2600 used 192 by 160 pixels, and the Nintendo Entertainment System 256 by 240, while your HDTV uses 1920 by 1080. This meant that graphics created on these old systems could only be so visually complex and have a restricted color palette. There's also the classic story of Mario and Zelda creator Shigeru Miyamoto giving Mario a big nose and mustache to get around the lack of facial detail. Much of this visual style was constructed with readability and gameplay in mind rather than any visual aesthetic. It was often also created by programmers who may not have had any real art background. Nowadays, most people see these visuals as crude and dated, our best attempts to realise something visually within the confines of technical limitation. But there are a core group of artists, musicians and designers who have returned to the scene of our early digital years to take another look at and uncover the unconsidered artistic merit and exploring the powerful possibilities of the pixel. Jason Rohr is at the forefront of the indie art game movement. His short 100 by 16 pixel game, Passage, is a surprisingly moving and engaging representation of life and death. He did all this with two characters no more than 8 pixels tall. I recently had the pleasure of interviewing him, in which he spread some light on the mysteries of the pixel aesthetic. For my third game, Passage, I stumbled onto pixel art almost by accident just because of the, the event that I was making Passage for demanded that the games be low resolution. So I was making a low-resolution res game, and that basically means pixel art. And once I started using pixel art, I realized how powerful it was. Because, well, first of all, it does look like something that came off of a computer. It's not really trying to emulate a visual style from any other medium. Second of all, it has this sort of, you know, it can be representational, but at the same time, it's abstract enough that you there's all this room for interpretation. So it's blocky and it looks computerized and it looks like something that's at home on the computer, but it also has this kind of expressive power and this kind of ambiguity to it. The more specific you draw something, according to Scott McCloud, the less likely people are to sort of identify with it and attach to it. It becomes a very particular person. It doesn't become just anybody or it doesn't, it doesn't leave room for you to step into it. I don't believe that pixel art existed in the way that we remember it existing. If you go back to like the 8-bit era uh, and you play a Nintendo game or one of those games that's normally think of, th thought of as being pixelated from that era, you play it one of those games on a TV set, which is the way we all played them, you don't see pixels at all because TV sets are so blurry. Um, you know, I, and, and if I think back about playing like 